Hello, everyone. A uh, very good evening and welcome to this talk, which is the third talk of our lecture series, Science and the Local. Uh, today, we have the pleasure of having uh, Professor Gordon McQuart with us, who is uh, going to deliver uh, this talk uh, from uh, University of King's College, uh, Dalhousie University. Uh, and uh, we have uh, Dr. Vinita Gaura, who is from the Department of Biological Sciences at ISA Bhopal who is uh, uh, going to respond to the talk. So thanks Gordon and Vinita for being here. And uh, I will hand over now to my colleague Varun, who will take over from here and introduce the speakers and um, then we will launch into the talk. So thanks everyone for being here. And uh, we look forward to uh, a very engaging session with Gordon and Vinita. Thank you. Thank you, Antara. And uh, hope I am audible and my voice is not echoing a lot. Uh, so good evening, everyone. And thanks for joining us on this uh, lecture series, the third lecture, as Antara pointed out. Um, so if you have not been following this lecture series, the, the first two lectures, uh, delivered by Dr. Arun Bala and Dr. Madhulika Banerjee is already uploaded um, in the Institute website. So you can have a glance at it whenever you have time. So this lecture series uh, attempts to explore the relationship between science and the local, the locality in which the, in which the practice of science happens. And uh, Today's lecture is, um, will be uh, delivered by uh, Professor Gordon McCord on how international circulating knowledge reconfigures biology and statistics, examining JVS Halden's passage to India. So, and um, um, I'm glad that uh, our colleague from the uh, Biological Sciences Department, uh, Dr. Vinita Gowda, has agreed to respond to this. So I will introduce uh, both of them, and uh, after that we can start the session. Um, first, a brief introduction to Gordon McQuart. Gordon McQuart is the director of the History of Science and Technology program at the University of King's College, Dalhousie University, and works on the history and philosophy of logic, classification, life sciences, and the origins of natural kinds. Dr. McQuart is the director of two international collaborations projects, Situating Science, Cluster for the Humanities and the Social Studies of Science. That's the first project. And the second project is Cosmopolitanism and the Local in Science and Nature, East and West, the second one. Recent books arising from this project include, uh, the first book is Circulation of Knowledge between England, India, and China which is co-authored with, which is edited with uh, Derby Lightman and Larry Stewart. The second uh, edited volume, which has come out as a collaboration is Narratives of Nature and Science East and West with Sundar Sarukai and Jobin. The third book, which is about to be released this year is Spaces of Science, uh, written, co-written with Larry Stewart. So I welcome uh, order. And uh, before we start, I have a brief introduction to Vinita. Vinita Gauda is a professor of ecology and evolution in the Department of Biological Sciences at ISO Bhopal. Her research focuses on understanding life history traits and the evolution of plants, especially in the Asian tropics. She has worked in neotropics as well as in paleotropics, except Africa, and Using this combined experience, she is currently interested in understanding and explaining the floral biodiversity in India, as well as in Asia, via molecular and ecological tools. She is also interested in the history in the philosophy of science and how cutting edge science can be made accessible and comprehensible to the public at large. So with this brief introduction to both the speaker and the respondent, we will start the lecture, the lecture today. Uh, the format that we'll be following is Gordon will speak for around like 40 to 45 minutes and uh, 
Vinita will respond to that over five minutes, for which Gordon will say a few words, uh, and uh, then we'll open the platform open for discussion. Um, looking forward for all of your participation in the discussion. So, Gordon, can you please start the link? Start. <laughs> Great. Everybody can hear me all right. Uh, it's no problem. I'm shivering a little bit. Yes. It's minus uh, 17 degrees here in Canada in my part. Uh, and uh, the heat went off this morning. So there's a log fire <laughs> burning right by me. Uh, if there's some kind of pipeline that we could shift and do entropy uh, things of equalization, this would be great. Uh, thanks to Varun for that introduction and for and Tara for, and for ISCR for hosting this and, and Anita for uh, taking this on. We'll see what happens. Um, uh, I'm gonna share my screen and uh, try to run through this in, um, let's see. Is that show up? Yes, we are able to see. Okay, so that's the title, uh, How International Circulating Knowledge Reconfigured Biology and Statistics uh, with uh, JBS Haldane's Passage to India as an example. And as Varun said at the introduction, I uh, am or was the head of a, or am, I guess, still the head of an international project examining the very question that we have on this um, uh, lecture series. Uh, uh, we put it under the title Cosmopolitanism and the Local in Science and Nature. Uh, and it is a collaboration between India, Singapore, some of the people that are involved in it are on this uh, watching today and several universities in Canada uh, to try to look at how um, in the uh, pre-colonial and post-colonial period uh, knowledge moves around and that our old models of both the structure of science, but also um, its uh, 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 relationship to colonization and decolonization might need some reworking. So what we're doing in this project is challenging the received view of the relationship between science and the locals, put simply, uh, which I um, discuss in the slide, if I could get to this slide, there we go. Um, the received view of knowledge to which we all are uh, sort of dwell under is the idea that there is a universalism, that science has this objective uh, quality, which has a specific understanding of objective as being perspectival free, alas, that is, it's not from any uh, position or a God's eye view, I guess, as Ernst Nagel once called it. Um, uh, versus the uh, particular, that is tradition or subjective knowledge. Now, don't think that I believe all these things. I'm saying this is the uh, received way uh, that we have understood science. And of course, the global versus the local, that uh, science participates in the, uh, uh, the globalization and the, not the obliteration, but the subservience of the local under the global dissemination stories that we get in the received view of science uh, has a center a periphery model that science originates or at least the modern science originates in Europe and then is disseminated across the world and that this participates in uh, Eurocentrism and a kind of hegemony of the uh, the global north if you like um, and that there is only one modernity and one science, one truth. Uh, and you guess what that is. Uh, that is the West versus the rest. This is the received view that even those post-colonialists that are resisting certain aspects of globalization and modernization believe this sort of story. Um, okay. Um, so what, um, in Canada, we're working very closely on the examination of the re relationship between so-called Western science and indigenous ways of knowing in Canada. That is uh, the ways in which uh, our uh, own indigenous people in Canada have representations and understandings of natures and dwelling in nature and how that is related to this um, slow called uh, globalized uh, um, Western vision. And I was gonna talk a bit about that, but then I thought because I'm doing another project with a wonderful graduate or a, sorry, student that's on 
line right now, I thought I'd talk about something specifically uh, um, uh, with relationship to India. Uh, and so if you want to talk about Indigenous knowledge in Canada, we can certainly do so in the discussion period. Um, uh, I am going to talk, let me see, oh, okay. Um, about the uh, uh, JBS Haldane and the relationship to uh, Indian science and Western science in JBS Haldane. Now, um, uh, we've already seen the challenge to uh, this um, East-West story in uh, Arun Bala's uh, connectionism, which you have already heard in our first of the, uh, these lectures. And Bala's work um, uh, deflects us from the so-called Needham question. I think he might have raised that uh, in his lecture, asked by the great uh, Needham, um, uh, Joseph Needham, a great Marxist biologist and Sinophile lover of China. Uh, and he asks, why if all these great developments in technology and science arose in cultures uh, other than the West, why did science and thereby modernity develop in the West and not the East? Now, I actually think it's a really dumb question, not because Bala rehearsed it, because Bala also challenges it, but I think it is a dumb question. Uh, these kind of counterfactual stories are, are weird, but Bala uh, actually takes the qu uh, question and does something interesting with it because he says um, that uh, we should crack open this hermetically sealed notion of the West and the East and understand the connectionisms uh, of uh, knowledge rather than the unidirectional nature of it. And so we could trace along Bala's uh, wonderful um, uh, silk roads, if you like, uh, of knowledge. And uh, this is just a drawing of uh, where uh, Bala imagines that uh, science through all of its trade networks uh, uh, became modern. Now, recent scholars uh, uh, working in this field have challenged our focus uh, not on the pristine origins that the uh, Needham question asks, but rather on encounters. And so we should look at encounters of knowledge rather than ones of dissemination or uh, single uh, origins, and maybe even uh, the notion of contamination and connectedness, rather than, as the post-colonials have described, it's just a mere el elimination, that's right, right, elimination of local knowledge. Uh, we could maybe even follow Chakrabarti's uh, uh, great term, he's not such a great guy, but the, you know, the term is interesting, uh, the provincialization of Europe and look at how the Silk Roads don't always need to uh, end up in Europe or even cross there. And thereby we could uh, imagine that there are multiple modernities and multiple globalizations through all of these networks. But still hanging over us is this um, particular notion that science itself is a universal and overcomes or uh, washes away particulars the local and ascending to the universal. I think Sundar is going to uh, address a bit of this in his uh, discussion of mathematics uh, later on this week. I'm gonna, uh, again, because the Indian connection, not co uh, concentrate on Aboriginal knowledge in Canada, but let's uh, give you an, uh, an Indian uh, context so that we can um, begin our discussion. And I'm going to concentrate specifically on uh, a place where East meets West and that there is a circulation and contamination of knowledge uh, and especially in biological knowledge, statistics and uh, politics. And it happens right with this guy, uh, J.B.S. Haldane. And I'm sure everybody in India has heard of him in the West. He is a big cheese lived from 1892 to 1965. Probably the most important um, scientist for developing both modern evolutionary theory, but also the most important Western scientist to take seriously the encounter with India and the East and make significant contributions to the critiques of received science because of that encounter. Now in India, you all know Haldane. I think there's streets named after him all over the place. And uh, um, uh, he, uh, you know, you bump into people, you hear, I read a lot of hagiographies each year written on Haldane. 
and his uh, passage to India. If those that don't know him are not doing biology over there at IS, uh, then you would probably know him as one of the three founding fathers of neo-Darwinism and the modern synthesis. That is the mathematical synthesis of Mendelian genetics and Darwinian natural selection, uh, which gave us uh, modern biology and all of its good and bad, including the genetic reductionism and biological determinism that might be snuggled closely to that uh, neo-Darwinian story of modern biology. And certainly it is the foundation of modern biology. And his causes of evolution from 1932 uh, is the moving text, I guess, in the creation of this new mathematical Mendelian genetics based on population biology. He's also known, if anybody does anything on ethics, uh, on uh, his uh, famous work on self-experimentation. He used to uh, uh, say that I will never do an um, experiment on an animal that I won't do, for my, uh, do on myself uh, because the phenomenological experience of the experiment uh, does not, you know, gets over the uh, alienation, I guess, if you use that highfalutin term, uh, of not understanding what is going on in the biological entity of which you're experimenting on. I have direct experience if I uh, experiment on myself. And he did all kinds of uh, stuff, in, uh, him and his partner, whom I'll talk about in a bit, Helen Spurway, experimented on themselves a great deal. This is him going into a pressure chamber where they put carbon uh, dioxide and to see at what stage they would pass out. What fun. Gordon. Uh, yes. Sorry to pause. Uh, sorry to cut. Yeah. Uh, I think the papers that you're using are very near to the microphone. Oh, so right. Okay. Um, how, okay. I'll put them down right here. It's just, I have some notes here and that's a new computer and it's a very good mic in this new computer. And you're probably picking up my heartbeat too. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, let me know. Okay. Um, okay. Um, Haldane uh, uh, is also known for his popularization works, and he's probably the most important popularizer of science in the 20th century. And here's some of the books, you know, continuously wrote books in Equality of Man, Collection of Essays, Diadolus, Science in the Future, uh, Possible Worlds, his work on the origin of uh, life of uh, which uh, Benita will be interested in, uh, also written as a popular book. And in 1957, in the midst of the Suez cri uh, crisis, he was led to denounce his British citizenship and his name chair at University College London and headed to India at first to take up a position at the, uh, oh, here's uh, Haldane as a shit disturber. I forgot to mention that. He's also a major uh, a political rabble rouser. And as a result of that, he denounced his uh, uh, British citizenship because of the imperial moves during the ba uh, war in Suez and moved to India with his partner, Helen Spurway, who is an ethologist and a very important uh, one as we'll uh, see. Uh, and moved to the India Statistical Institute in Calcutta uh, uh, to uh, uh, set up his home there and do his biology in India. So I'm going to look at his encounter there and how that encounter changed science and changed uh, the understanding of science towards a more local understanding of uh, the importance of variation and difference and and explanation and all that sort of stuff. Um, now, if you're in the West here, you rarely hear of the India Statistical uh, uh, Institute or even this move. Uh, but people should know that, um, uh, while well, there you probably know the India Statistics uh, uh, Statistical Institute established in 1932. And it's the first such institute in the world uh, to uh, uh, focus on statistics. Uh, and the model for all biological institutions across the globe. And it was uh, born in a struggle for Indian independence, formed by Western trained uh, Batalok uh, physicians, uh, physicists, uh, sorry, physicists, 
uh, where, uh, where they uh, created a hybrid encounter with mathematics and statistics on this new local landscape and in this anti-colonial uh, uh, anti India. Um, under the influence of uh, this guy, it was formed. See if you got, oh, there's some uh, students there, including uh, John Robinson, Haldanes on the left at the bottom, uh, and Mao Halanabis, the founder, who is right up there and now in this picture with Haldane. PC Mahalanabis, um, who lived from 1893 to 1972. Everybody knows him uh, uh, there as the author of the first five year plan and uh, very important in Indian statistics and biology. And I want to concentrate a bit on, uh, on um, this encounter as a way in which to do introduce the local not only as an influence uh, uh, to the universal, but um, that the local here will give structural meaning and robustness and, uh, and rootedness. Um, so uh, let's look at Mahalanabis. Um, under um, a circuit, uh, you know, circulating route himself, of course, he's born of the Indian uh, elite, but he studies math under the colonial regime and then studies at the elite centers in the metropolis, uh, the colonial metropolis of London and Cambridge, and then returns home and then builds the uh, local institution. Now, this transference of knowledge looks like the classic colonial notion where, you know, some of the colonial subjects learn some of the stuff and then they come back to the center and they get fully robust and then disseminate into the, into the colonies. Uh, but let's look at his non-colonial work as a way in which knowledge is transformed in this local encounter and, uh, and its origin. Now, Malonibus is, um, uh, here's a couple of things, uh, you know, he was also uh, um, instrumental in the first translation of Einstein's papers into English, so it was translated in in India and then spread through the English world uh, of the encounter with um, uh, um, relativity. Um, but I don't want to concentrate on that. I want to look at the three, maybe four important gestures that Malonibus made in his encounter with statistics that's going to change the world and make statistics and biology look a little more interesting with respect to the local. And I'm going to give them very quickly because I haven't got a lot of time. The first one is the Malonibus distance function. And the Molonibus distance function, if anybody studies uh, uh, statistics there, knows about it uh, immediately, but they might not know its origin. And it came up uh, in the 1930s and 40s um, as uh, 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 Mahalanabis resisted the no notion of pure caste as one of the bulmar, uh, bulmar, uh, bulwarks of colonial rule. Um, in one of his earliest investigations, Molotopus turned to the study of the distribution of anthropometric uh, uh, anthropometric um, measurements as the results of marriages between Europeans and Indians in, uh, in Bengal. And the Europeans grounded their statistical analysis on individualist studies of distributions and relations and uh, and had a one sort of one-to-one -one relationship between uh, a distribution and an individual. But for Malonibus, this makes an individualist mistake. One had to study the relationship between populations and comparing group relationships. And he insisted that the, one had to study the distance between a point and a distribution. That is how many standard deviations the point is from the mean of the population. And this resulting distance fu uh, uh, function was especially strong at um, identifying groups and distances between groups and subsequently became one of the major technologies of modern statistics. But it arose in Mahalanobis resisting the Orientalist and a colonialist notion about caste in uh, Bengal. His large-scale sampling surveys 
uh, were devised during the Bengal famine of, 18, of 1943, where between 1.4 and 4 million uh, out of a population of 60 million uh, Bengalis lost their lives to a uh, confluence of natural and colonial and world war causes. Now, uh, the, uh, the key to the slow intervention and inability to tackle the famine was the complete lack of reliable statistics and production forecasts. And Molotovus threw scorn upon the entirely trust, untrustworthy statistics of the colonial rulers. The sampling techniques that they used were mere, uh, when they weren't mere guesses, were singularly unsuited to the variety and distribution of crops and markets and peoples in India. There was no measures for actual yields or areas. Uh, and Molotovist solution was to envision a new method of sampling, which has now become completely normalized in uh, sampling techniques across the world. I'm not gonna describe them at great length, but it is a, a very robust style of sampling that takes into the wild variety of non-monogenic uh, crops and peoples. And uh, um, if we want to talk about it in the discussion, we can go through his, uh, his sampling technique, again, as a resistance to colonial rule. And uh, the um, uh, planning and biopolitics, I'll talk about it. Uh, and I'm now going to alight on something that Dr. Sundar Sarakai will be very interested in. And this is Malanabis' interest in Indian logic. And early in his career, Malanabis uh, emphasized the probabilistic nature of the new developments that were happening in physics. Remember, he's the, uh, one of the translators of Einstein and quantum mechanics into English, and how all of this new physics was questioning the ontological and epistemological assumptions of our understandings of nature. Determinism was dead, he thought. And variation and probability was now the order of the day. And we're seeing a, a, a sea change in our ontologies, I guess, both in the East and the West, uh, and our metaphysics of science, away from notions of fixed essences, so dear to Western logic and metaphysics, and that a new conceptualization of, um, of, uh, of ontologies and logic had to be in the air, but Western logic was failing because of its Aristotelian ground in essences and uh, determinations. And so Molonibus started very in his early uh, career, a study of uh, alternative possibilities in Jainan logic in India and presented a very important series of papers on uh, Indian logic and its contribution to the new ontologies and physics, uh, or sorry, ontologies and, and uh, logics of the new uh, revolution in physics. For Molotovist, Indian logic was a logic of relations, not of essences. And this opened the door for a reinterpretation of physics and logic in the Western, uh, the, the received Western tradition. And he presents it to the West. That is, it's not merely uh, being done in the West, but it's now done in India to offer an alternative logic and uh, an ontology to uh, the development of physics. Now, uh, that's a lot on Mahalanabis. Let's get back to Haldane and what Haldane encounters when uh, he moves and as an anti colonial gesture into India. Um, and um, Malonibus recognized Haldane as an anti-imperialist fellow traveler, a politically committed biologist, a statistician, and organizer dedicated to uh, modern uh, Indian independence, and a philosophically astute um, uh, uh, thinker as well. Haldane brings the Journal of Genetics, which is the most important genetic uh, journal uh, of the period, along with him to India in the attempt to decolonize its content. That is, give it more 
of a variety of encounters and uh, uh, papers and a diversity of authors, not just the global uh, north. I have a student, I think he might be online right now, uh, Arden Ergolsky, who has uh, used the study of science uh, metrics to see whether the Journal of Genetics actually gets decolonized as it moves to India in 1957. Now, Haldane's move to India in 1957 on first gloss looks like the traditional, you know, center to periphery, uh, you know, I'm pissed off at the center, so I go to the periphery uh, and uh, hang out there for a bit, uh, like a good Orientalist, uh, except that when the encounter in India happens with Haldane and Mahalanabis, things in biology begin to change. So significantly, Haldane says, the very landscape upon which we are doing genetic science is different in India. There's a groundwork of variation, of radical variation rather than the monocultures of Europe. Uh, the idea that uh, variation and difference is the ground of a biology and statistics here makes Haldane scratch his head and say, maybe part of what we were doing in our genetic determinism in, uh, in the global north was misplaced. We have to look at diversity. And this also attracts his partner, Helen Spurway, who says, look, diversity and difference is at the ground and the field work done in India is more important than the laboratory work being done in the globalized North. Significantly, in working at the India Statistics Institute, Haldane immersed himself in the deep study of Indian logic and philosophical systems, nurtured by Malonibus's own work. Uh, and he absorbed his mentor's engagement with philosophy and logic and expanded on Malanabis' lead and displaying almost immediately a prowess in taking Jaina logic and showing how probabilistic judgments flow directly from the simplest of causes. And so like Malanabis, he, he was careful to recognize that, you know, it's not that we have to go back to Indian logic or something like that. And they had, you know, like our... Um, Hinditfu uh, friends will tell us that it's all there in the original text, but rather it's a resource for rethinking the Western logic. Uh, and uh, with all of these encounters, Haldane presents almost immediately a different view, more local and more interesting view of biology and uh, modern science. And it is in his uh, um, Sadar uh, Patel lectures on the unity and diversity of life presented on Indian radio in 1957 and printed in 58 uh, that we see Haldane shifting biology or biology shifting under his feet, I guess, and reintroducing um, the central biopolitical slogan of his host institution, the ISI, unity through diversity. And that's the title of his lecture. And he begins his radio talk by, with an explanation of different forms of Indian logic and their applicability to modern conceptions of science and life. And then he uh, moves over to the question of organisms as commonwealths and as individuals, the relationship between the individual and the commonwealth. And that's used as a leverage against essentialism. That essentialism of the Western received view of science is kaput. Instead, we should turn to mixtures, mixtures of local variation, and that essence is the essence of a dog, the genetic essence, was the wrong way to go in the first place. This is an attack on uh, what has been called beanbag genetics. And Haldane, while in India, opens up a debate with the great naysayer for beanbag genetics, Ernst Meyer at, uh, at Harvard. And this wonderful debate that happens between uh, Meyer and Haldane 
Haldane being a representative of the founder of modern beanbag genetics, you know, that is that genes are like beans and they're picked out uh, and they're determined into proteins that are paternal in bodies. And Ernst Meyer who says, well, maybe that's not right. You watch how Haldane's encounter with India begins to shift him over and his mathematics to a different understanding of the relationship between genes and bodies. For Haldane then, the emphasis is now going to be on variety. And in 1958, Haldane presents a very important paper. I'm not sure if any of you have read it, an Indian perspective of Darwin in the Centennial Review of Arts and Sciences published in the United States on how biology should change by this encounter. And he's now calling himself Indian uh, cultural appropriation maybe, uh, but he is now saying that there's a perspective that is local that should tell us something about our biology and about uh, the nature of science. And, um, okay, Darwin, he, he starts off the article by saying, I could not have written this article before I became an Indian. Darwin, says Aldane, is rightly recognized as an event in the development of all thought and especially Western thought because it convinces us of the fact of evolution. And we descend from animals. But he says Hindus and Buddhists and Jainans of India and China needed no such convincing. But rather, Darwin's real contribution to biology, said Haldane, was not the notion of natural selection, which we hear in the modern synthesis and modern biology. And Haldane says, our predominantly Western prejudices tied to colonialism and domination, that is ideas of natural selection and survival of, his, uh, of fittest, of fit, fittest but rather the real revolution in Darwin happens in the studies of the irreducible variety found in the world. And if you look at Darwin's origin of species and most biologists don't, the opening chapter, two chapters are on variety and variation. And so Haldane says, Darwin turned our vision to the wonderful nature of irreducible variety. But Western philosophy looks for essences and is less interested in the details of natural objects in their locale. And so there's a tension in modern Dar Darwinism. Darwin, especially in the last chapter of The Origin, foreshadows a logic based on differences, says Haldane. And then uh, Haldane points to a whole um, branch of statistics based on random sampling, and especially Moholanabis's notion of sampling. Maybe natural selection is identical to uh, Moholanabis's notion of random sampling in statistics. Nature is statistical, but it is statistical not in an essentialist European sense, but one that is informed by the variation in Indian thought. And so, so there's a complete realignment, a realignment that uh, Haldane's encounter with the local in India is now reconfiguring all, all of uh, the understanding of biology and reintroducing it rather than the dissemination from the center to the periphery, the so-called periphery is now reintroducing a new view of variety and biology and logic into the center. I can do one more, yeah. So the reworking of neo-Darwinism in the biological uh, locality of India uh, is concentrated on contingency and variety, and that nature is a historical experiment of sampling, such as that uh, we see in Mahalanobis, and that the local is uh, 
at the very ground of understanding science and biology. He also takes one more uh, ter interesting turn, his self-experimentation, which was done always under phenomenological understanding, European notions of the self and everything like that, would now be reconstituted to be one about the ethics of our fellow animals and not just about the phenomenology of the self. And Haldane presents us with a new cosmopolitan um, uh, synthesis of modern biology. And here is Haldane's practical experiment with reconfiguring knowledge uh, out to the West. Learn from this encounter to find from the local that biology itself was local and that there are fundamental things to glean here. Now we can't go uh, all um, uh, uh, fuzzy. Maybe we can discuss about this in the uh, in the discussion group whether uh, this is successful. Haldane is sometimes uh, uh, denounced in Indian biology as somebody that wanted to keep uh, uh, laboratories down and field work up. Uh, same with Spurway and thereby uh, creating a, um, uh, a disenvelopment uh, in Indian biology. We could talk about, about that. Uh, but what I want to emphasize is this one quote from my colleague, Sharon Kingsland, who is one of the <clears throat> great uh, historians of uh, modern biology. And uh, she tends to agree that modern biology is only possible from its encounters with the various local perspectival uh, views of what it is to be biological. And so I'll just quote this. Uh, the modern synthesis of biology followed a somewhat different course in different national contexts. These national differences were largely the result of differences in the institutional content of science, the economic resources available to evolutionary biologists, and the different developmental pathways followed by biological disciplines of different countries. The modern synthesis or modern biology, of course, had no conceptual essence, but represents an evolving dialogue played over several decades across several disciplines, and as she should have said, several locales with individual views changing over time. So here is a local story giving us a, the, a resistance against the notion that universalism destroys the local, but rather is reconfigured by its encounter with the local. And it's not just the epistemology of the science that uh, Haldane is emphasizing in the local, but the very nature of science itself, the God's eye view for him and for modern biology should be a thing of the past. So we have some conclusion, I'll put them up um, and questions we can ask, uh, how is the, in this lecture series and also this lecture, is the relationship between the universal and the local being manifested by these new crossroads in India or in the stories that Bala and others have been tolling, telling? Uh, does the local site of knowledge have anything to do with its content? Are there styles of reasoning? And what do we learn from those different styles? Are these essentialist? Is there something called the West versus these? And why do we still talk about those things that some political theorists talk about the other? And, and I'm going to return to Bala's question at the very beginning of this lecture series. How do we rewrite those old, tired Plato to NATO, Greeks to the modern geeks, unilinear stories in light of these countless encounters of which the Haldane Mahalanobis nexus are just one example. I think I've kept under the uh, uh, time uh, thing. Here's a wonderful picture of Haldane's library um, in India, which is now being um, slowly deteriorating. He might want to all visit there. So I thought I'd finish with that wonderful picture. Okay. Uh, Gordon, thanks for the brilliant lecture and also um, for keeping on time. Um, I would request Vinita to respond, and after which, uh, of course, Gordon can respond to Vinita's points. Yeah. 
Yeah. Thanks, Gordon, for a fantastic talk. Um, also, because it's very different from the Haldane talks that I'm used to, which we always talk about genetics <laughs> and genetics and, and you know, I mean, the, the, the biology side of it, which is great. But it's also nice to see the how the how his thoughts were shaped by him being here, which is, of course, known, but it's still nice to hear it um, different view, uh, again and again and in, through different viewpoints. Um, so I... Uh, just, I mean, in, I, again, Haldane is a very, very big figure, uh, not just because he was in India, but also as a, as a biologist and as, as a evolutionary biologist specifically. So there's many things that we can touch about, which is why I said that one talk may not be sufficient actually to touch base on many things. But few things that I have um, learned about Haldane only after I decided sort of um, to get into evolution and and what, what, which was also a little later in life. And when I first thought about getting into ecology. Um, and one of the perspectives that I, I feel Haldane brought in and which has stayed to date is, uh, at least among ecology and evolutionary biologists, is the use of statistics and math with biology to understand that, that sort of, you know, uh, sort of combination of, of sciences, which I felt, um, still on a local scale math is different and then there is everything else you know also that there's the hard science you will still hear um, the word hard science and soft science and so the hard science is math and physics uh, the soft science is biology and chemistry falls somewhere in between and uh, for a very long time that is how i think is still true for most in biology and so what is interesting from while i was also reading up on haldane uh, from whatever material you sent and also other papers I found. What was interesting is that how he was angry that in India, uh, math was not considered important for biology, you know, and this variation that you're talking, that you presented, uh, you know, the, the idea of how variation is very important and how that sort of is important for, from what Marlon Abyss had for, in terms of his ideas on statistical sampling. If you didn't have variation, there is no question of sampling. And how these are actually important features of what we call as biodiversity in India, or the diversity in tropical countries in general, um, is something that I found very, very interesting. So while he raised this sort of annoyance saying that, you know, I don't understand what's happening in India, why do they not actually um, connect a variation with math and, and then biology? Um, I also find that while we revere Haldane on one side, we still have forgotten that part about him, you know? And so I'm not able to sort of understand um, how we, and again, like I said, Haldane is a big figure in biology. You know, every kind of, I, I expect every ecology and evolution student would have heard about him, uh, would know something about him. And yet these small points are lost. And I feel those small points are actually the fundamental points of what he was talking about, which, which were triggered by his moving into India, you know, like uh, as a space. And, and what you pointed out about the mayor versus Haldane argument as well. Uh, very interesting that he was, he, he someone who was so hard headed about what his opinions were, did change once he entered the Indian space and realized how variation just sort of swamps you in India, which is something I've heard from many, uh, you know, Westerners who come to India, that the, the variation you see, the diversity you see, whether it be culture or, or anything else, kind of swamps you, you know, and, and it makes you think differently. And then your science changes, which is absolutely fascinating because, you know, like what you started off with, you think of science as being very objective, uh, you know, and and or, or, or and and free of your subjective thought process, but it clearly is not. Um, and so that was sort of an in interesting point for me to to hear from you about, you know, specifically how how he he had a very specific point, uh, viewpoint, and and the local space managed to change that, and and. The statement that I really liked is when is, is the statement that you quoted that um, nature is statistical, 
And that's really nice way of saying it, that, you know, there is a pattern in everything, which is what he did, I think, in India as well, of looking for things. Um, and I agree that he sort of, in India, he's he did say go out in the nature and look for things, uh, look at the diversity. But it has also led, I think, in uh, more recent times into science where, interestingly, uh, we think that genetics is everything. You know, so I think there are two sides of Haldane as far as I see it. Again, from a plant perspective, I really know more about the plant studies that he did just because I was interested in it, uh, which is not very extensive, but they're fantastic with a few things he did. Um, so he leaves a very interesting legacy in the sense that he proposed that math and biology should be always taught together, and yet it's not. Uh, we still haven't changed that. Um, he suggested diversity was very important and therefore we should step out like what you mentioned you know sort of uh, i think you said something about field work done in india is sort of a larger in terms of you know the space scientific space than lab work done in the west uh, most of us tro tropical biologists would say that but it doesn't sound good when i say it but it sounds better when haldane says it <laughs> you know <laughs> so uh, so i think it was it is sort of um, I, I would like to know why as, as a culture, we have still not been able to see this, that a person from the outside came and saw something, and yet we refuse to see it. So I see that as, as, as a great thing that we have the diversity, but I also am not able to understand how should I interpret the fact that we didn't take his statements very seriously when he said, look, do your bio, biology and math together, combine these sciences and look at the diversity as something good and something that you really need to explain and, and analyze and study, you know? And instead sort of we've, we've moved towards homogenizing everything and saying, you know what, let's do something like the West because, you know, it's really nice to see round red tomatoes, which all look the same, you know, as opposed to having them in different varietal forms. So, um, so yeah, it's kind of, it's, um, I mean, I, I, I see what, uh, what he has brought in and how he changed his thought process. But I'm not so sure anymore that um, if we've been able to adopt and adapt uh, the thoughts that he brought. And similar to what you're saying, that if the library is not being preserved, that pretty much suggests what we have been thinking about his thoughts as well. That if it's slowly deteriorating, I think that sort of unfortunately represents what we have done with his discoveries as well. Um, so sorry, this is very long sort of response. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So thank you for the for the talk. And I, I I've noticed that I think there are Manjuri and few others from other ICERs are also here. So thank you for joining. Uh, since Varun I does not know them, so I thought I'll oh there's Manjuri, yeah. Yeah. So Manjuri has a sorry, Varun, I'm done. Yeah. Manjuri um, had a card you want to respond? Well, a couple of things. I, I want to take up the time on the discussion, uh, but uh, the, the word objectivity came up and it's always one that comes, comes up with my students all the time. And we created a notion of objectivity as this, um, again, Ernst Nagel describes it as the view from nowhere or view from God, uh, God's eye view or something like that, that leads to, uh, I think ba uh, Bala talked a bit about this. I know Sundar will do so. Uh, that we always imagine that objectivity means a complete elimination of the perspective of which one encounters the world. But that cannot be, uh, possibly be true. We've made a mistake at uh, associating objectivity with that. Objectivity in its original sense meant knowledge and closeness to objects. Now, where do you get uh, close and uh, knowledgeable of objects? Not by abstraction, by going to the universal, but by trying to figure out how they interact and uh, intertwine, not only with uh, each other, but also with the perspective that uh, one is encountering the world. And so, and you can see this a bit in Haldane's writing and certainly in some philosophers of science that have followed that we have to reconstitute our notion of what it is to be objective. And it cannot be that we eliminate the perspective of uh, the encounter with objects from that story. And a lot is to be learned from that. And it's uh, ecology does it. Why doesn't genetics and physics uh, uh, like to tell that sort of uh, story? 
uh, while it's done in physics, especially quantum mechanics, probably in a crazy way, uh, um, uh, but it's still part of our ideology that we move to uh, a non-perspectival view is uh, always the objective one, but that might be just false. Uh, and we might have to reject that. On the statistics side of things, uh, yeah, you get a lot of hagiography of, uh, of, uh, of Haldane in India like crazy. Uh, and and also in the West with respect for founder of modern genetics and everything like that. And what a great guy. He smoked a cigar while he swam and uh, wild stories about him. But nobody ever wants to really snuggle in there and see what this final project was uh, offering. And it offered the diversity notion. It offered a reconstitution of um, mathematics and statistics into biology in a in a, a different way, and the emphasis on, on variety. Uh, India goes uh, towards just developing the Western uh, model, um, and that's an interesting story of which I uh, talk for hours about, but you, you know it firsthand from your perspective. <laughs> the Mandri asks, actually asked uh, just before uh, I hand it back to Rune uh, in the comments about the uh, data on uh, Journal of Genetics. My uh, uh, research assistant Arden is online here, I think, uh, and he's done a bundle of work on this and we are presenting it in uh, a couple of places this spring. It's not, the data hasn't been completely um, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, uh, digested. Uh, but it does look like there was a real shift, not only in the authors in the Journal of Genetics, but the very content of the types of paper uh, and themes of paper as it shifted from one place to another. Back to you, Varun. So Gordon and Vinita, I'm very, I mean, like, glad to hear this conversation. And I hope this... Uh, has raised a few more questions and I would request the audience to respond, ask, contribute. So uh, I would request the- uh, Yeah, Manjari has one more question, Varun. Yeah, yeah, so can, uh, Manjari, you want to go ahead? Manjari, you can unmute yourself and ask. Thank you, Professor Gordon. This was amazing. I mean, absolutely fantastic talk. I greatly enjoyed, you know, and uh, rightly, I think uh, I took a good decision to uh, send my daughter to <laughs> her friend's place so I can listen to this in peace. Absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, I also wanted to know um, your perspective on how or rather what uh, Haldane may have gained from his move to uh, India or uh, uh, in the other way, if he had not moved to India, what do you think from um, uh, the, uh, what kind of perspective do you think he may have not gained if- Oh, any? very interesting. Look, um, uh, as Arden has shown, again, my uh, 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 research collaborator, um, that the interest in India started before 1957. And there was a lot of, uh, in, India had this huge, just after independence, as you know, huge amount of special people in statistics going there and doing all kinds of stuff. And Holding became interested in it because he was also a Marxist at that time uh, and was looking at how Marxist uh, theory was criticizing both eugenics and a genetic determinism that was uh, the main ideology of, uh, of um, Western genetic. Every Western geneticist was a eugen eugenicist, that is a believer in planned uh, application of genetics to produce master races or better people and stuff like that. Every one of them, except for the people that were uh, in the sort of left Marxist camp in genetics, and they were trying to look for different ways of understanding the determination of bodies through genetics. Um, you know, it went as radical as Lysenko, uh, but not always uh, towards inheritance of acquired characteristics. So he was shifting. And so he looks towards India and stat as the st statisticians there for offering a slightly different understanding about the determination of characteristics in populations. 
but I absolutely know that he could not have gone all the way in thinking that there's a new logic available for this kind of work and that diversity was at the ground, right? Uh, and so I imagine that had he stayed in, in uh, Britain and not gone to India, he would have worked more on the, you know, the Marxist uh, crit criticism of genetic determinism. And he wouldn't have emphasized the notion of variety and statistical sampling. And that he gets from being in India. And it's wonderful to watch these, you know, the ISI becomes a, a mecca of people that are working in statistics uh, to try to figure out the new methods of sampling and new methods of, um, of distance functioning. And so you get all the top statisticians coming from the West to uh, Calcutta to, to do uh, work there. And it shifts as a result. Long answer. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, so um, talking about uh, his uh, Marxist lineage and uh, how shifting to India would have uh, had shaped him differently. One of my colleagues here, Dr. Raja Krishnan, has a question related to that which I'm posting here. It is sent to me over private chat. So, uh, Gordon, you want to respond to that? Is this the one that's in the comments that you just put up? Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, this is his yeah. question. Uh, yeah, okay, good one. Um, okay, the question is asked, uh, as a card-carrying communist, which he was, uh, did Marx's view on the evolution of society, primitive hunter-gatherers to more modern industrial societies influence Haldane science? I mean, one of the vulgar uh, um, interpretations of Marxism is that everybody goes through the same stages, right? And they go, do, 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 like a, <laughs> I call it the escalator of history. Um, and uh, and that they each go through their stages and that India should be on its way, I guess, to becoming something like the West. Um, and now, um, I, you know, I actually don't see that too much in his Marxist writings. They're more philosophical and related to the very nature about the idea of explanation and um, uh, um, Oh, sorry, uh, explanation and logic in the in the grounds of science. But he does write in this uh, very um, controversial book called The Inequality of Man. Uh, and he does talk about primitive and not primitive and stuff like that uh, in this book. But it was written just as he was becoming a Marxist. As he becomes a Marxist, the slogan for the title changes from uh, the inequality of man, meaning you know, some people are lesser than others, uh, to the notion that diversity matters, not about rank, and that we are all different. That's what he means by inequality of humankind, and that a society should be built that is from each according to their abilities and to each according to their needs not on the grounds of their uh, for, uh, formal merit. And so he uh, uh, is um, disputing that notion that there's a, uh, a conga line, I guess, of being uh, mm -hmm. up to the uh, perfect liberal subject in modern uh, times, which looks something like an English shopkeeper. Um, uh, it, he is resisting that stuff. So he doesn't have much to say about the anthropology that you ask about. Um, or the evolution of society. It's more about the very structure of science that he's interested in. So thanks. So can I ask? Yeah, yeah, please. Yeah, yeah. So I have one more question is, uh, the idea of this reductionism that that Haldane sort of brought in before he came to India, right? So, or at least the way I understand is that he was considered a reductionist before he came to India, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. Yep. And, then, and and and, and um, hence his sort of the term of the beanbag geneticist, and then sort of the diversity sort of changed that idea of you know reductionism in some sense. But I have to say that in what I find interesting is that I don't think he would have had that um, combination with. ISI or with statisticians, if he wasn't a reductionist in the first place, you know, so 
in in the sense that you know i i feel like for math you have to reduce everything to a simpler form right in biology you do the complete opposite in in the sense that you look for diversity all the time so i kind of wondered while i was reading for uh, about him recently if that combination was also kind of required that you know that he was a reductionist of course the fact that he was willing to change is 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 yeah. who hardin is i think that is a property that is to be appreciated uh, you know and and that makes him haldane i think that you know yeah. he he was willing to change when he saw the difference uh, but i wonder like you know if that's why sort of this this idea of not many people see this differences you know that or appreciate variation because if you're always swamped in it you're not going to see it you know but if you come from that the perspective that he came in maybe that's where you actually saw it you know and i i wonder if this is oh this that's is fascinating look uh i think you're on to something there his attraction to go to that institute in particular is because mm -hmm. of the statistical uh, yeah. um robustness of it right mm -hmm. and it seemed to you know uh, people in political science use this term biopolitical that is they wanted to reduce everything down to uh, mm -hmm. uh statistics on life and make the state based on that right mm -hmm. so it's very this is cool this sounds, looks maybe like a planned economy uh this looks like we can really get to the mathematics uh, that are responsible for this right mm -hmm. but it's actually to use a marxist term uh it's a little more dialectic insofar mm -hmm. as that the isai and molonibus are both trying to reduce down to mathematics and to especially some statistical methodologies but their style of reasoning is resistant to what they think is the western and the british notion mm -hmm. of statistics mm -hmm. that brings it down to the individual right mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. the individual is the site of a, of statistical um scaffolding i guess that's mm -hmm. based on that uh and if you look at how statistics changed in the 20th century uh mm -hmm. the move away from a determinant individual that's determined by all the antecedent conditions to a statistical one where it's uh it's only a propensity to act as a member of a population mm -hmm. uh that really changes everything mm -hmm. i think mm -hmm. and uh and holdain is moving from an individualist viewpoint to the one mm -hmm. where the statistics are uh are about propensities that are not reducible down to determinist stories mm -hmm. and uh, and that adds to variation right because a real good variation story in evolution is one where the Uh, you don't need the determination of variation right it doesn't need mm -hmm. to be determined it just mm -hmm. needs to be a property of uh, of difference right yeah and, just and so going over there he, he encounters two things one an ideal place to do this nobody else in the world is doing this uh, as much as this and at the same time what they're doing is resisting the very notion of what i thought statistics was about when mm -hmm. i hung around my uh 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 fisher and and uh, pearson and uh, my teachers in in britain mm -hmm. wamo uh so it 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 messes it up i guess mm -hmm. so, yeah if, uh, you have, uh, yeah one more yeah one more question was that um i mean again this is more sort of what is currently going on which i kind of touched upon uh, early on is this uh concept of uh, many indian universities sort of dropping math as an essential field for biologists <laughs> you know which is sort of the complete opposite i mean how common is this in the west that oh. the that the math and bio uh, biology are seen as um subjects that truly don't necessarily need to meet i mean if they meet great things happen but then it's like it's it's about the general concept right you don't feel it's i mean to say that they they are essential is different than well they can work together kind of thing so right. i feel that uh, not many people say um 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 uh, about you know like uh whether it's important or not so manjuri said but what about icers do you see it as a positive change well yes and no because yes manjuri i think in most icers we do but we don't insist um I mean, there have been discussions, which is where I'm coming from, where uh, students insisted that to be in math they don't need biology, and to be in biology they don't need math. So this has come up, and it comes up every 
couple of every semester i would say so unfortunately if we drop it in the icers then yes we will i mean it is it is a challenge for us as well um so we so always and and, and the idea is that um, the way these two subjects are taught is that either you're inclined towards it or not which is true in some sense but but it is true for any subject we all have certain inclinations but to suggest that you don't need the subject is something hmm. that is quite uh, unacceptable to me uh, yeah this is this is fascinating look, uh, look um i teach in a you know, uh, the two universities i teach at one is predominantly humanities and the other one is predominantly uh, uh, science research uh, with biology way at the top um uh, i tease my biology students that they go into biology because they don't want to go into physics um uh, and do all the math uh, and i really tease my humanities students that they're in humanities because they can't do either <laughs> they can add up to seven um now that's a pity eh that's a real sad uh, state and it's the state of the field out here i know that sundar will be talking about the relationship between mathematics and science in the uh, next uh, lecture but the the way that science uh, mathematics is taught here and i'm sure it's taught there uh, is really alienated for people that might be attracted to biology in the sense that they are concerned about you know how plants live and and uh, you know how a dog uh, develops and that the math seems so alienating or, or difficult but it doesn't have to be right there's different ways of doing math not uh, not the new math that uh, uh, wrecks people in school uh, but uh, of understanding it conceptually right why are we looking at a um, a, uh, a, a, um, a calculus uh, which looks like a memorization thing of a certain type of formula. Conceptually, it's fascinating to think about the uh, movement, uh, instantaneous movement with relationship to time and space. And why, why can't the people that are interested in biology and physics, uh, or sorry, biology and psychology or humanities find their place in mathematics uh, by uh, looking more at the conceptual ways that it's right rather than this this clamp that happens oh we'll do the uh, mathematics it'll be very difficult and esoteric and you'll die uh oh, well i would rather go over here and just look at plants and uh, not have anything to do with it uh Holdane was a classicist do you know this that he had no training in math no i didn't know that he, no. he was, his degree is in classics like latin greek oh wow uh, and uh, and he uh, he did his math and uh, he um, he revolutionized statistics and biology mathematically, but without a degree in mathematics. Oh, now, wow. It would be hard to find a classicist now that knew any math <laughs> at all. Or, or, but, or it's the other way around that it's it's yeah. hardly that we would respect a classicist or we would allow a classicist to do do what he did. I think it would be the other way around. I think that oh, yeah, we, you're right. we don't allow. Yeah, 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 yeah. And the same with the, the great um, uh, Darcy Thompson, who uh, uh, worked on morphological forms. Yeah. Uh, he was a classicist uh, yeah. that became interested in form. And we'd never allow it now. And this is a this is a tragedy. The two cultures, uh, although we always talk about interdisciplinarity and all this sort of tub thumping about this stuff. Uh, nobody ever wants to uh, say, well, let's do something interesting that way. I have a, a few of my students. I have a wonderful student who is an um, ex-student who is a the professor of art history at Glasgow University. And she's working with scientists now to do different representations of mathematical stuff in artistic form. And she says, there's no division between humanities and, and sciences. Uh, bring them on board. And it's wonderful to watch this kind of thing, uh, but it's still resisted in the uh, university structures, both there and here, mm -hmm. and in the teaching, it uh, totally alienates people. Mm -hmm. In psychology, they pick up, uh, uh, you know, the stat statistics and things like that, but I call it spray on statistics, right? They've mm -hmm. learned a few methodologies, they plug in their n equals 12 study uh, a tiny and then they think they have a distribution or something like that but it just pours out of their uh, whatever computer program they've handled and very few of them understand what the hell is actually going on 
Mm. And that's a pity because it produces so much bad data and so much uh, causal inference from bad uh, cor uh, correlations, mm -hmm. hugely bad. Uh, so we got to change the education system there and here. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> So by that time, we wait for others to warm up to ask the next question. Uh, Gordon, I have a question to ask, and which um, is connected to the last statement that you made after the discussion time during your presentation of uh, going from Greek to the geek. I mean, like, how is that, or why is that, like, say, the, the importance of the local doesn't emerge in other, other disciplines, sub-disciplines of science? Like say, I mean, it's so great of the, the 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 importance and the need of a local um, in biology that we see is not sadly observed in like say physics or chemistry. And um, one of the reasons, I mean, like I've been thinking about that after you pointed it out, and um, uh, I read uh, two steps further. But that is where I would I would want to tell you, like, want to tell that, and probably you can say how it further or what you can add your points to that. One of the ways that like say the, the discipline of biology itself and what it is concerned with seems to be with the natural history of uh, the, the world or the universe or the earth that it stay in. Um, and somehow uh, physics and chemistry um, uh, is interested in the counterfactuals. Like say, what if the electron was of a different oh, wow. uh, mass? <laughs> you would have had a different universe and they'll play with the parallel universe. Oh, very interesting. And so on and so forth. So given this tendencies that the non-biology discipline have um, to methodologically um, include uh, local, the local specific data or configurations, um, it seems quite impossible that like, they, they would be ever be interested in. Um, yeah, there will be. Uh, the uh, wonderful philosopher of science, Nancy Cartwright, um, and Nancy Cartwright wrote a couple of books, The Dappled World, which is difficult but worth reading, and her uh, classic piece called How the Laws of Physics Lie. And when she says lie, she means two meanings of lie. One, how they lie on the landscape of of thought in the world. And the other one is how they are lies, right? Uh, and not in the sense like the, you know, so postmodern social constructivists or something like that. It's just all made up or something like that. But she rather is pointing out that no law of physics holds except in uh, with uh, auxiliary hypotheses up the wazoo, I guess is the scientific term. Um, you know, without a, pa a, a pile of uh, this is the case that, uh, uh, and those are all got to be local, right? Um, uh, um, what is his name? Hasek Chang uh, wrote a, a, a book based on this notion just a few years ago called Is Water H2O? And he, and he says, you know, the common law that we might have water freezes at zero degrees Celsius never holds. No water uh, statistically is ever froze at zero degrees Celsius uh, because, you know, it's got different content, there's pressure, there's blah, blah, blah. Uh, all the... Um, auxiliary hypotheses that are required to make a law of nature universal are where the real action lies, right? And it is a counterfactual, if you like, uh, um, but it's in the counterfactuals or the imagining uh, uh, scenarios where uh, the conditions are can be controlled uh, that the uh, real interest for scientific universal laws lie, but that they are not descriptions of nature that are universal in the sense that we have often understood them to be. So in physics and in uh, uh, you know chemistry and things like that, you know, um, oh, I actually remember this uh, uh, wonderful debate uh, that uh, the, um, one of my colleagues is a very, very top mathematician's head of the department. And uh, he was arguing with me about such things. He said, well, yes, but there are universal laws like two plus two equals four, right? You always hear this one, that two plus two equals four. 
And I said, I'm not so sure. And we were sitting in the cafeteria with a bunch of students. And he said, well, look at this. Uh, and he had two plates here and two plates for my students. And he said, okay, let's count, count them. And uh, so we, they wanted to throw And then I stacked them and I said, one. <laughs> so two plus two equals one. And he said, no, but that's not, you know, we were trying to think of individuals lying horizontally across. And I said, well, you put, you put conditions upon which your uh, necessary Euclidean story of mathematics uh, applies, but I can imagine uh, circumstances where, uh, where that doesn't apply, or you have to put the conditions on. So even the application of uh, mathematics, insofar as it's supposedly universal, uh, itself rumbles into the spot where uh, the local conditions under which it me gets meaning matters right mm -hmm. so physics and uh, and, um, and and chemistry and all that they sort of know this right you sort of know when your zapatron at cern is firing your uh, thing around a million times and smashing to bits it's what's happening in the cloud chamber that matters uh, but it's that particular cloud chamber that's keeping it going and keeping it uh, you know vitalized that sucks half the energy of the European Union to fire that thing. Uh, that, all of that is required to make that uh, a counter, uh, well, it is a, what is it, an actualized counterfactual uh, appear in front of you in the, in, the, uh, in the cloud chamber. So that's mighty local to hold that, uh, you know, the um, quirks and quarks are at the very bottom of being. And that's will piss off all the, uh, the mathematicians that are listening today. <laughs> but, but I have to say that I've also met mathematicians who were the complete opposite of what you were described. That is, if I said two plus two is four, they would say, well, most of the time. So yeah, I think, there we go. <laughs> yeah. So Good I up. think I've also met people who will put the disclaimer there. And so that sort of, so I think, I think it may also be the kind of math that people come from, that there are some who always put in a disclaimer for everything. And then there are ones who think there is sort of this, absolute uh you know outcomes yeah it looks like we can have a new research project of where like say uh, how different is the electron in isopropyl and the electron found somewhere else so Ooh. yeah <laughs> so before, uh, don't, don't don't go to electrons <laughs> yeah. so i think arden has a question that he has posted in the chat box Okay, uh, is this from Martin? Yeah. Oh, look at yeah. that! He's uh, he's in uh, he is in Canada right now, but a thousand kilometers from me. Um, uh, okay, um, uh, Arden asks whether the I mean Holden is known for his earlier work. Uh, but not remembered so much for his uh, uh, later work in India. Uh, uh, has uh, Haldane's work in India been neglected? Do we need to reassess its impact? Yeah, I hope I wasn't making the claim that our, uh, Haldane changed in India and then all of biology believed him. Uh, that would not uh, uh, be... Um, in fact, I was doing much like his... Um, and Mahalanobis's encounter with Jane and logic in the sense that a new source is available to uh, understanding biology, the emphasis on variety and the emphasis on non-essentialist reduction of, of gene determinations. And that holding presents such an option and it's been resurrected like crazy. I mean, if you're in, in biology uh, now and I work with some, some of the best on the planet like uh, Ford Doolittle and um, uh, John Archibald, uh, who are all coming in that direction. Uh, and they are, uh, you know, wonderfully uh, saying, ah, maybe we have to revisit not the earlier stuff of Haldane and the modern synthesis, but how it begins to uh, uh, um, soften, I guess, in its uh, later years and encounters. So much like Jane and Logic, uh, Haldane, uh, for me, is a resource that uh, might give us some uh, finger posts to say, 
let's start rethinking about how uh, the modern synthesis should be understood. But uh, those that are in India could also answer, uh, you know, as Haldane's later work in India uh, um, really thought about, except for that he's a great guy, which I often hear in, in uh, India, right? That he's an important guy that came to India, but uh, people mm -hmm. assessing whether that later work um, had any impact, it's not mine. Mm -hmm. So another sort of question that I've, again, this is sort of a little bit off topic, although connected is, um, sort of, I think maybe Varun, I mean, we, we should kind of discuss this in the social context, um, is uh, as a tropical biologist, we often discuss this, that why do tropical biologists think differently than temperate biologists? And and I, I don't think it's got to do only about the latitudes. It's about where those latitudes are and what is the history behind those latitudes, right? Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that I think the, the debate between Mayer and, and Haldane uh, emerges from is Mayer being a tropical biologist had uh, and a taxonomist so variation was very 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 important and also he was sitting in a department which had very big stalwarts like Asa Gray and others um, big botanists who um, contributed a lot to the variations and you know the concept of variation the concept of taxonomy and so in some sense I think coming from that uh, you can see that Mayer always thought variation was sort of very important. And I think Haldane, again, coming from that genetics perspective, ended up having that re reductionist idea, you know, that that this is, and, and so for me, um, for a very long time, um, until really very recently, I always looked at Haldane as the temperate biologist, you know, and, and, and so for me, Mayer was like the tropical biologist. I mean, I understood everything that he said, but for to understand Haldane, actually, it was very difficult for me. I mean, I understand what he's trying to say in terms of scientific dialogue, but, you know, the larger, bigger concept, it was, was a little difficult for me. Uh, but then I also found a lot of researchers who found Haldane to be, you know, they had understood everything that he said and, 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 uh, what I see is that, again, there is this tropical temperate taxonomy versus non-taxonomy. So somehow variation is the a sense that strangely divides uh, these two thought processes, is what I wow. feel right now. And, and fascinating. And it just goes into, like, you can go to tropical meetings, you can go to temperate meetings, same issues. And so somewhere, this very little divide of how much variation you're going to face in your field, in your, you know, whatever object that you're studying, uh, changes the way you see things. Um, and so there are all these like, you know, artificial constructs and lines you can draw just based on this, this concept of how many, how much, what is your probability of <laughs> facing variation in whatever field of science you're studying? You know, in my case, it's very high. So, you know, I'm sort of, I have to, I cannot afford to be not open. You know, I have to be open to concepts. And, but then if you're working in, with model systems, you can choose to be closed because, you know, you're working with a model system and everything is closed, therefore. So some of these larger concepts of social and, and local kind of also, I think, gets influenced by these. Wow. The science, you know, how the science is. Yeah. yeah. We, we had a workshop uh, up at um, Shimla uh, three years or four years ago. Uh, on cosmopolitanism in science mm -hmm. and there was a, 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 a idea floated there I can't remember who I have to look at the the um, the collection of papers from it uh, and introduced the notion of a cosmopolitan objects uh, very fascinating uh, and say that there's just certain kinds of things in science that lend themselves to the study through variety and uh, others that uh, lend that call forth this is only one interpretation mm -hmm. uh, to us. And so we shouldn't be dogmatic in our always looking for variety because there just are some kind of things that, that gather people around in their perspectives and say, oh, it turns out, uh, Electron is a classic example, right? It, uh, they're supposed to be all identical. Uh, well, it might be something about electrons that that uh, that create things like physicists that think that you can create a definition of um, of uh, electron that everything follows from the definition because electrons are like that uh, biological entities including genes might not be like that mm -hmm. they might be ones that have 
various vernaculars, if you like, right? Um, mm -hmm. Uh, um, uh, like a cosmopolitan species, for example, the very term cosmopolitan species is one that pops up all over the place, but it does so in uh, different contexts and different ways of po uh, popping up. And so there, it might be worth having a look at the way the lay of the land uh, produces the possibility for different types of, uh, of sciences. Mm -hmm. That would be very local. <laughs> <laughs> And to add to what Gordon said, Vinita, um, the very creation of, uh, I mean, the difference that you're pointing out of the tropical and the temperate first emerges in the, uh, in the field of medicine during the colonialism where, like say, uh, when the East India Company sets up its groups and um, business in, the, in India and Brazil and several other places, uh, the doctors who have to deal with different kinds of diseases that the soldiers get affected with, they find that those kinds of diseases have a different variety and a different characteristics in India and uh, in the colonized mm -hmm. contrast to the, the, the place where they come from. And that creates to a dialogue which took half a century uh, to create what is the difference between called as the tropical medicine and the temperate medicine. Mm. So, so it is because of that the the research in malaria and several other like the leprosy gets intensified because of the doctors coming to the colony, colonies and doing the yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that is that something that I learned. Yeah, that's something I learned in the U.S. during my grad school. That uh, I found it very strange that you go to the West, I mean, a country like U.S., and suddenly you see very heavy investment in studies on malaria and some of these and some of this some tropical diseases that you know is linked to their sort of war areas or the fact that they want to expand their army bases and then we come to india where these are <laughs> real problems you see the concern on cancer or things that truly is fine i mean it is a disease but truly not the major uh, uh, you know local sort of disease of concern so it's very strange how you have these two polar opposites, you know, and studying completely different diseases because the focus is completely different. So it's got nothing to do with the science behind it. It's really got to do with the how, what the economics and the, and the social sort of you know, application of it, which I was I was I was quite stunned. I have to say, it took me a while to under to digest yeah. it, that science was not so independent, you know, or, or the amount of research that is plugged in is not so independent. So it comes as a shock when you have a very naive idea of what science is. So, yeah. <laughs> so, you have to um, sit in my classes. Uh, we dismantle that one. Um, the, uh, just aside on that, uh, 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 Mahalanabis' uh, sampling technique, the interesting one that he pressed against the, the, the British sampling techniques and he included the economics as a as a factor in the sampling upon land so how much resources do you have available to do the sampling uh well, is part of the the uh, factor of the of working out the statistics and he said uh, not just because you're trying to see how much money you have to spend on this but it is actual real variable uh, and the real variable is not something that's separate politics and economics from, uh, from the lay of the land. And that is fascinating to think that, uh, that he is not making the usual distinction between the science and its context, mm -hmm. but the very science is, is snuggled close to the, mm -hmm. the context. Um, as one of the uh, people uh, in the chat pointed out, uh, the new book, A Dominant Character, The Radical Science and Restless Politics of J.B.S. Haldane, not a hagiography at all, um, uh, worth uh, having a look at. I have to review it for a thing that has some problems with the science. I don't quite um, think that the author uh, understands it completely, but uh, a very nice book, just been published. Mm -hmm. So if there are no further questions, um, we can wind up. The... Okay, then. so it looks like, yeah, Gordon, thanks a lot for taking time and being part of this and uh, kickstarting interesting conversations. And I'm sure as we go ahead, uh, we have further things to add to this.
and uh, thanks a lot again and thanks a lot Vinita for being also taking part in this conversation which I think is a is in the spirit of what we started the science at the local where like the humanities science every every discipline comes to try to understand this so thanks also everyone for taking time and uh, joining this conversation hope we can continue this further through various channels email whatsapp and various other modes of communication so yeah Thanks, Thank you. everyone. Thank you, Gordon. Yeah, thanks so much, Thank Gordon, for that very fascinating uh, talk and discussion afterwards. And thanks a lot, Vinita, for the very, very yeah, yeah, great commentary. Wow. discussion. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We should okay. continue. Thank you. That's yeah. right. Well, we'll all come back at uh, at Sundar's one and uh, go at mathematics. That's coming soon, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Everybody show up at that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Okay. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. -bye. bye.